seemingly spring, but we know it's not spring yet, but sure does feel good. This morning, I'd like you to open up your Bibles into Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes was an investigation by the wise man, the wise preacher, who was Solomon, who had access to unlimited resources, apparently. And he utilized these resources to investigate what was, what was real in life, what was rewarding in life. He came to the conclusion that all was vanity under the sun. And finally, in, in chapter 12, he, he makes a, a statement in, in uh, the first verse. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. So remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. This morning I'd like to focus upon talking to the youth. Now, as we consider these, this passage, it's, it's, uh, it becomes apparent that the writer, as he's using the word youth, is those days in your lives where you have strength, where you have vigor, where you're able to perform before the days that you lose your strength. You no longer have your vigor. But as he, he says, remember the day the, 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 thy creator in the days of thy, thy youth. Why? Why remember him the days of thy youth? Well, there are multiple reasons. But consider that while you're young, you have strength, you have energy, you have... Uh, um, there are very few things that could impede you. But also, as you consider, as we prefer, prepare for the life to come, when we pass on from this earth, having prepared early in life... Um, um, it's, uh, we ha have learned a way of life that glorifies God. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this passage is most often used to impress upon teenagers, that's how we usually use it, how important it is to be faithful to God from our early years. As one continues reading the very verses which follow, he understands that the wise teacher is admonishing everyone to serve God while he has the strength and energy to do so, because the days are coming when because of our diminishing stamina, we will not be able to serve him as before, with strength and vigor. Nevertheless, it is scripture, scriptural to focus upon the young people to help them see the special uniqueness they have in serving the Lord because of their youth. We'll discuss that a little bit more later on. Now, consider some of the examples in the Bible that you can read about who served God in their youth, when, they're, when they were young. First, I'd look at it, like to look at it as David. Remember King David. Now, the account of David and Goliath shows the confidence he had, which stemmed directly from his confidence in God. Here is a young shepherd boy that uh, when Goliath approached the, the Israel, Israeli armies, his being large, nine cubits tall, a very large man, or is it? And, uh, of course, it, it struck fear in the hearts of all the warriors of the Israelites. And David, being great in faith and confident in the, uh, the ability of God to deliver them, he goes forth to do battle with Goliath. Of course, Goliath was insulted with his mere size, a mere shepherd boy, a young man like he was. He was not a large, ruddy, um, seasoned warrior, but rather just a young shepherd boy. Well, as Goliath was chiding him, telling him how, what terrible things he was going to do, David responds with 1 Samuel 17, 45, says, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. Whom thou hast defiled, this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take uh, um, take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that's pretty pretty uh, big talk for a little fellow that's going to try to take on a giant whose sword was probably very difficult to wield. Do you remember when he went, before he went to do battle with Goliath, he put on Saul's armor, and he clanked around quite clumsily because this armor was just too big for him to move around in. He wasn't used to it, and it was just too big for him. You know, Saul himself is a large man. And he stood his head over, all over the, the, the rest of the, the men, of the, the rest of the Israelites. So as David approached Goliath, he was pretty confident in serving God, that God would deliver him and Israel. So it shows forth how a young man able to serve God in his confidence and his faith. Okay? Now consider also Joseph. 
from Genesis 39 through 50, that is chapters 39 through 50, it speaks about Joseph and his life as, uh, as he lived in faithfulness to God. And he considered he was the youngest among 12 brothers. brothers. And uh, he was not very well liked among them. In fact, you consider that in spite of all that happened to Joseph, his brothers betraying him, selling him into slavery, being falsely accused of, of accosting Potiphar's wife during his employ, and spending time as a prisoner of Egypt, he did not give up hope and trust in God. And neither did he give himself over to, dis to dissipation. He lived a pure life throughout. And so God was able to use him. Remember the strength he had, the, the moral resolve he had not to sin as Potiphar's wife came toward him and, and uh, tempted him. And so he rejected that and he ran away. So his faith is a good example, his example to others of how a young man or young person in general can be in service to God. They also consider Daniel, who was taken away into captivity in the Babylon courts, uh, the, to serve in the Babylon uh, courts. Um, as he was taken away uh, from his home in Judah, a uh, young man, he was made a eunuch, and he was made to serve in the, in the uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's court. And uh, yet consider his faith remained. Turn to Daniel chapter 1, if you would, please. Daniel chapter 1. Beginning in verse 5, and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. So they had a, a, a particular diet that they were going to give these, these young men that they had, had taken to serve the king's court, go through the training, the Chaldean colleges, to learn the Chaldean tongue and the wisdom and the, and the, and the sciences and such. And, uh, uh, and there was a diet that they thought was going to work very well. In verse 6, now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Unto them the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and Hananiah, Shadrach, and Mishael, of Meshach, and Azariah, of Abednego. Now all of these names were to glorify the gods of the Chaldeans, to glorify the Babylonian gods, so their names were changed. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine that he, which he drank uh, thereof. Or therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince, prince of the eunuchs. So the, the prince of the eunuch heard Daniel. He made an agreement that after 10 days, if Daniel and his uh, three friends uh, were, were uh, uh, after 10 days of this diet that they were to eat, separate, different from the king's diet, that if they looked better, sharper, than, than the rest of all the others who were there, that uh, they could continue. If not, they'd eat the king's diet. Okay. But uh, they, it was shown that uh, the diet that the Daniel and, and Meshach, uh, Shadrach, and Abednego had eaten was turned out to better. But the, the insistence of Daniel not to devile himself, he was sticking with the diet that was prescribed by the law of Moses. Okay. And further on, it was, it was because of his uh, dedication to God, God was able to use him. And as the years went on, not only Daniel, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in their dedication and, and resolve to serve God, they glorified him in spite of the, the uh, uh, perils that came to their life because of their faithfulness to God. Okay? But notice how these four men, young men, dedicated themselves, resolved themselves to serve God in their youth and on up. Okay. And the last example I'd look at this morning very quickly is Jesus. Jesus, our great example. Look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Look, beginning in verse 42. And when he was 12 years old, talking about Jesus, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, 
both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Um, and so as Jesus had dedicated his, his life to God, of course, understanding that God was his father. Okay, look at verse 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother uh, unto him, son, his mother said unto him, son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. So they were concerned. Now, how you consider that G, uh, Mary knew very well who Jesus is, was. It was the angel who came to her and announced that she would be with child, not have, or having known a man. So she knew that this was the, the literal son of God conceived by the Holy Spirit in her. And so there she was raising up Jesus, Emmanuel, Prince of Peace, uh, Mighty God, all these things that she understood who he was, and they lost him. She lost him. How can you imagine she would feel? She lost the Son of God. And there they were coming back, and she asked him, Why did you do this to us, and, and, and disappearing like this? Verse 49, and he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not, saying, Which, is, which he spake unto them. And he went down with them, and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom, and stature, and in favor with God and man. So as Jesus submitted himself to the will of his parents, as was good and right in the law of Moses, remember we are to honor our father and our mother, and so he did, and as he grew up, he increased in wisdom. Where did he get that? Study the scriptures. He, uh, he increased in stature and in favor with God and man. So all these things, as Christ, as Jesus, uh, had uh, committed himself to service with the Lord, and so it is, we look to him as that great example. So it is with us today. As young people, you have a unique opportunity to begin very early in your walk with the Lord. Many people never find the truth until many years later. Okay. They haven't had that opportunity to, um, how should I say, refine their walk, to, uh, to uh, develop those good habits and so, as young people, you have a great opportunity to, to commit yourself, to resolve to serve God throughout your life and to go toward that goal. Now, some ways that youth show forth their great examples. Some ways, there are some ways. That youth, and so we'll look at some of these. Our speech, it reflects our character. In Matthew 12, 34, Jesus, of course, talking to the Pharisees, what did he say to them? O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. So we, we uh, show forth our character and our nature based upon our speech. You know, as it is a good well that brings forth good speech, sweet water. Bring, good well brings forth sweet water, but not bitter. Okay? So it is with a man's heart, it brings forth good speech. And so it is our own speech reflects our character, our nature. And so as you consider how we can uh, show good character, glorifying God in our speech. You know, we should guard our speech, as Ephesians 4.29 lets us know. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So we have a responsibility with our speech to build up others. And it's not just those of the church. It's all our speech should bring forth sweet water, as it were, okay? Those words are under edifying, building up of others. Our conversation, well, we already talked about speech, so it's conversation is not our, our talking, but rather our manner of life. You know, it's our whole manner of life that res, uh, reveals we can either glorify God or, or maybe convince others that Christianity is, is a hypocritical religion. So as we walk soberly and righteously and godly in, in, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, Paul writes to Titus, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So the grace of God brings to us the understanding. It teaches us that we should live soberly. That means we live seriously, contemplating about the seriousness of what life is here. Okay. 
so that uh, as we resolve and whatever steps we take, that we are, we are doing so that is consistent uh, with the will of God because our desire and our hope is to be in heaven with God. Also to uh, live righteously and, to, and godly in this present world. Not just a world where there's no sin and no influence and no temptation, but this world right now where we are, we should resolve to live righteously before God. Just as Joseph and Daniel and Jesus all resolved to live righteously before God. Um, we should let our Christian light so shine. Let the lower lights be burning. That's a good song. And you consider that some people will never get to hear the gospel, but they might see it in your life. They might see it in, in the way you behave, in the way you respond to other people, the way you talk, things, the topics you don't talk about and the topics you do talk about. Some people won't get the opportunity to hear the gospel, but they might get to see it. So as we let our Christian light so shine, in Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that, you may see, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. You know, that's not, and that's not bringing attention to ourselves for self-glorification. Rather, it's a way to glorify the Father in heaven. We also exemplify good, uh, show forth a good example through charity, that is, love. In Matthew twenty two thirty six, one came to Jesus and asking him questions, and of course Jesus said, what's the great commandment? What are the commandments? And he says, Master, which is, uh, which is the great commandment in the law? Rather, he's asking what, Jesus what this commandment was. What is the one? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. So we should give forth our, our uh, resolve. It's all about resolve, isn't it? We have decided we are going to give God our everything. What is left? What is left that we should not give? We should be devoted to God. In 1 Peter 1.22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Unfeigned love. Unfeigned. It's not fake. It's real. It's, it's, uh, it's not a plastic face. So we should exemplify. We should give forth a good example through the love of the brethren, and not just the brethren, but all. You see, we should, leave, we should see that we love one another with a pure heart fervently. And it should be pure heart, honest, sincere, genuine. And we should also give forth a good example. That is, young people can give forth a good example with the spirit of, or devotion. They must have total commitment to the Lord. As I said earlier, Math, uh, in Matthew 6, 33, G, G, um, Jesus said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He was talking about those Gentiles or anybody who focused so much upon what I need to do to get my food, to get my clothes, a place to live, everything like that. Jesus is saying, don't worry about these things. The Gentiles can think about that. Of course, we know we're Gentiles in the blood. But he's talking about those who are uh, uh, <clears throat> not focused upon following after God, following after Christ. We should uh, con concentrate on the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. And those things that, that everybody worries about so much will be added unto us. Okay, and Luke... Twin twenty-seven. it's revealed that we should, our whole being must be dedicated to him. A parallel passage to what we just read. In Luke 10, 27, And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. <coughs> this is the man that answered Jesus about what is the great commandment. And so as we consider this, what is left out? If we love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul, every bit of our life, and with all our strength, every, every bit ounce of energy that we have in us, and with all our mind, what is left? That is total commitment. And you know what? Many people look at when you consider that uh, Christianity demands total commitment. They look, well, that's very cultic, isn't it? Because many cults will manipulate people into giving everything, every bit of their life. But this is where Christ demands this, but it's our own free choice. We're not manipulated into this. This is something we choose to do, but yet it is still required 
And what happens when we do give our all? Do we not grow in the truth, grow in the faith? Do not we change because of what the scriptures teach us? Do we not become better? Do we not, uh, do we not be, follow after that pattern that makes us righteous before God? So as we consider good examples, we must devote our whole life. And we also must be pure in our life. You know, youth should remain unspotted from the world. And as James 1, 27, pure religion undefiled before God is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So we know that there are so many temptations in this world, so many ways that we can, we can follow after that would take us, distract us, take us away from God. Our focus is no longer upon those things that are healthful, that is good for our spirit, but those things that would take us away from God. You know, the very thing that Adam and Eve, in their sin against God, they ate of that fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That took them away from their focus upon God. They were no longer focused upon what God had said, what was right. And so it is, as sin is the great deceiver, as we consider the temptations and following after sin, it will lead us away from God, and we won't necessarily see it coming. It's very... Uh, minute in, the, in the, um, the steps that one takes till he's finally totally lost. When I say totally lost, what I mean is very difficult to come back to God because he's so blinded. So, and young people should remain holy as a living sacrifice. In Romans 12, 1, <clears throat> I beseech you therefore, brethren, that by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So as we can transform our mind through the, uh, the learning of the gospel and incorporate these teachings in our lives, model our lives, control our lives by these teachings, our mind is being transformed, and in so doing it transforms our life that we may prove what that... What is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? It shows forth that perfect will of God. So what does God demand of youth? What does he demand of those young people who would follow after him? We know that, as we read in Ecclesiastes 12, 1, that we should remember our creator in the days of our youth. So we should remember him in the days of our youth. And we should dedicate to him. And his, we should be dedicated to him in his ways, in Romans 12, 1 and 2. We've read that as well. Um, that we should, uh, by the renewal of our mind, we show forth those that acceptable and perfect will of God. And we should accept the f and fulfill one's responsibilities as a Christian. In worship, John 4, 24. In our work, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. In our teaching, Mark 16, 16, remember when he told his, his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that, is belie that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And we should fulfill his will in our studies. As 2 Timothy 2, 15 says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be unashamed, and rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, you've probably noticed that throughout this sermon, many verses were used which apply to all Christians, not just the young and not just the old. That's true. Nevertheless, some scripture was pointed directly toward the youth. And, and by extension, toward the old too, because we should have learned that when we were young too. Or if we had had the opportunity to learn that, we should have taken the opportunity to dedicate our lives and following after that which is right, after, the, after God. So as young people, they're very important to God. They really are. To Jesus and to the Lord's church. Young people, you're the future of the church. You are the future of the church. As you consider, those elders didn't get to be elders overnight. It took years of training. It took, I say training, years of discipline to their own lives. It took years of living the Christian life. Years of study. And then all, you know, as evangelists or as deacons, all these are men and that, that are need to prepare themselves to fulfill these different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, 
roles. So as the future leaders, the elders, the preachers, deacons, teachers, and just everyone else who will serve the Lord with all their heart, mind, and soul, and strength, they're the future of the church. The church needs to be involved in growing the next generation who will be filling the shoes of the current leaders of the church. So the young people, they need to be loved and trained in the nurture of the Lord. So you young people, consider how, you'll be re how you are ready yourself to be prepared for his service. Dedicate your lives and your efforts in growing in the Lord to be ready to serve him and serve when the opportunity avails. And look always for you can be involved always with a ready can-do attitude. Now, yes, I'm talking to the youth, the young people here, but I'm also talking to all of us here, all of us. And like I said, most of the verses I use this morning were not just geared toward the, the young people, but all of us. We should all strive to give forth a good example of the Christian walk, glorifying God, showing forth our light in those works that glorify God. This morning, the, the invitation is given to those who may need to obey the gospel. And if you feel you need to obey the gospel, to uh, having, having heard the gospel, having faith, uh, confessing Christ, and be, repenting of your sins, being baptized, then come forward and be baptized for, uh, for the remission of your sins. If you need to respond to the gospel, then come forward as we stand and sing.